or Revelation chapter 15. Then I saw another great and awe-inspiring sign in heaven, seven angels with the seven last plagues, for with them God's wrath will be completed. And I also saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had won the victory over the beast, its image and the number of its name, were standing on the sea of glass with harps from God. They sang the song of God's servant, Moses, and the song of the Lamb. Great and awe-inspiring are your works, Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship before you, because your righteous acts have been revealed. After this I looked, and the heavenly temple, the tabernacle of the testimony, was opened. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues, dressed in pure, bright linen with golden sashes wrapped around their chests. One of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Then the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and severely painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped its image. The second poured out his bowl into the sea. It turned to blood like that of a dead person, and all life in the sea died. The third poured out his bowl into the rivers and the, and the springs of water, and they became blood. I heard the angel of the waters say, You are just, the Holy One who is and who was, because you have passed judgment on these things. Because they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets, you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. I heard the altar say, Yes, Lord God the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth poured out his bowl on the sun. It was allowed to scorch people with fire, and people were scorched by the intense heat. So they blasphemed the name of God, who has the power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. The fifth poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues because of their pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they did not repent of their works. The sixth poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming from the dragon's mouth, from the beast's mouth, and from the mouth of the false prophet. For they are demonic spirits performing signs who travel to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for the battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Look, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who is alert and remains clothed so that he may not go around naked and people see his shame. So they assembled the kings at the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Then the seventh poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came from the temple, from the throne, saying, It is done. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake occurred like no other since has been on the earth. So great was the quake. The great city split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered in God's presence. He gave her the cup filled with the wine of his fierce anger. Every island fled and the mountains disappeared. 
Enormous hailstones, each weighing about a hundred pounds, fell from the sky on people. And they blasphemed God for the plague of hail, because that plague was extremely severe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I wonder if uh, you've heard this cry go up. It's not fair. What does, or why does he get that? I didn't act that bad. That consequence isn't right. Where's the justice? From the cricket, or from the cafe to the cricket pitch, or the footy field to the federal court, this notion permeates our society in small and unimportant ways to complex and significant ways, from kids to whole countries. I wonder where you've heard it. It's not fair. Where's the justice? It's ingrained in us as people, embedded into our very being, a characteristic of our creator himself. We get annoyed when someone cuts in at the cafe or when the umpire gives a dodgy call on the cricket pitch. We ask if it's fair when on the footy field the other team gets another set of six or when a significant decision gets overturned in federal court. Last week, we finished up with one of the most gruesome and graphic scenes in Revelation. I hope that you didn't hear it and just move on. Uh, Verse 20 of chapter 14. Uh, Let me read it out for you. Then the press was trampled outside the city and blood flowed out of the press up to the horse's bridles for 180 miles. Grapes representing the enemies of God have been gathered up and thrown into the wine press of God's wrath. Uh, The magnitude and horrific nature of that image is meant to move us. We are meant to be emotionally stirred by this. And so I wonder if after reading it again, what your reaction is. Is that fair? Is it a bit too much? Is God overreacting? In chapter 15 and 16, we get an answer to that question. Now, spoiler alert, we hear a resounding yes, God is just, and that is something to celebrate. Let me pray as we get stuck in to the text. Our Heavenly Father, give us faith to receive your word, understanding to know what it means, and the will to put it into practice. Our Holy Spirit, move us today. Uh, that we may be more like Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Uh, for those who might have missed a week or two, uh, or if you're just joining us in this series, uh, we are edging towards the end of Revelation. A Revelation is a clarifying word about the faithful witness, Jesus. Uh, he's described as the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. A revelation is written by a faithful witness, John, to God's people so that they can be a faithful witness to a watching world. They are to proclaim and practice Jesus in the society and world in which they live. Last week we heard about God's people and how they're characterized not by their own works, but by the work of Jesus, who lived, died, and rose again. As Bernard mentioned, it's probably the shortest biography of Jesus' life. Now, Jesus has conquered death. God's people have conquered the dragon, not by their own might, but by the, the blood of the Lamb and the words of the testimony about Jesus. And they follow Jesus wherever he goes. As the seven signs in chapters 12, 13, and 14 wrapped up, we ended with the scene of Jesus reaping. Our readers are confronted with two stark alternatives. The hope of salvation shown in the harvest of God's people and the threat of judgment 
in the ordering of the press of those who have rejected him and his rule. These alternatives highlight the contending truth claims. Agents of evil seeking to influence the world by deception and intimidation, setting up a kingdom opposed to God. In many ways, this is quite an attractive truth claim. Be who you want to be, be prosperous in trade and stature, blend in with everyone else and don't face persecution. But you do have to give honour and glory to the emperor. You do have to bow to the beast. Alternatively, as the angel announces in 4, 14 verse 7, give God the glory. Fear God and give him the glory. John challenges the perspective that evil is invincible or perhaps not evil at all and that godliness only brings loss and suffering. He pushes back against that but with the words This calls for endurance from the saints who keep God's commands and their faith in Jesus still echoing in the reader's ears. John points us back to the heavenly throne room in chapter 4. Verse 1 of chapter 15, Then I saw another great and awe-inspiring sign in heaven, seven angels with the seven last plagues, for with them God's wrath will be completed. I also saw something like a sea of glass. John sees another great and awe-inspiring sign. He says that God's wrath with these with these bowls will be completed. If the previous cycles of judgment were the initial slides of an overhead projector, then the seven bowls of God's wrath will be the last slide overlaid on the top. Or what's the effect? What's the purpose, or what's the response from those who hear it? Well, as John says, before we even get to the next cycle of judgments, we hear a song coming from the throne room of God. I don't know about you, but wrath, judgment, and celebration are not normally something that I would put together. And yet this is what John sees As readers, we are transported back to chapter 4 when we were first introduced to the heavenly throne room. And we're told that John sees something like a sea of glass, but this time it's mixed with fire. He sees those who were described only last chapter, those who were victorious over the beast, its image, and its number. In the face of the threat of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet, we see that it really is a non-contest. Jesus wins and his people are victorious. Before God, they sing the song of God's servant, Moses and the Lamb. Verse 3, they say, Great and awe-inspiring are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship before you because your righteous acts have been revealed. Uh, This little song, while it may sound similar to the ones we've heard before, help us to digest what John has already described and to process what John is about to say. Now, this little song is similar, but it is different. Two phrases in particular stand out. Just and true are your ways. You alone are holy. Are we started by asking the question, is God's judgment and wrath on the world fair? Is it right that the countryside is flowing with blood for 180 miles? Now, this song answers that question. The song of Moses and of the Lamb say, yes, just and true are your ways. Up until now, God has been described in what could be described as power terms. You are sovereign. 
almighty, unique in purity, the one who forever was and ever will be, worthy to receive glory and honor and power. And so it's very important to take note when something new is introduced. It's only now that God is described as just. God is not overreacting. He is not vindictive or giving arbitrary sentences. A Richard Borkham, a theologian who'd spent a lot of time on Revelation, says that the judgments are not capricious, one-off acts of a ruthless and unethical tyrant, but demanded by the very nature of his of this righteous and holy God. God is acting in accordance with his good and righteous character. The judgments don't raise questions about his goodness, but verify and uphold his righteousness. Uh, just interesting to note, the word used for holy here, uh, so holy in verse 4, and holy used in verse 5 is different from chapter 4, where God is described as holy, 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 the threefold holy. Uh, those, that holy is more describing his uniqueness in purity. Uh, here, holy is describing God's righteousness. For you alone are holy, you alone are unique in your righteousness. There is no wrong in what God is doing. And so there is a song being sung by those victorious over the beast, celebrating God's acts according to his character. God acted justly when he redeemed and rescued his people from the hand of Pharaoh. And we're meant to connect these two. The events of the Exodus... And the events of Revelation. It's a song of Moses and of the Lamb. The song echoes Moses' words in Deuteronomy that we heard read out earlier. What's already been described in the previous seven judgments and the seven signs already show God's justice and the righteousness of God. And it's worth celebrating. But it also means that the judgments that come next, so remember this song is just a prelude to the seven bowls, these judgments are equally justified. They are a right response from God. Uh, Also the treatment of the scarlet woman riding on the beast in the next section is justified. So seven bowls. John sees seven angels coming out of the temple dressed very similar to how Jesus was dressed back in chapter 1, dressed in pure, bright linen with a golden sash. Now, they are delivering God's just punishments. Now, they are pure in their action. Note again that there is no confusion as to where the judgments are coming from. They are from God himself. As with the previous judgments, uh, hopefully you've become more and more familiar with the judgment cycles in Revelation. There is a pattern. Bowls 1, 2, 3 and 4 focus on the earth. 5 and 6 target the beast. And the 7th is a short yet glorious account of the end. So while, yes, there are patterns with these bowls as well, there is some differences. And so we're meant to take note of these differences. Uh, As Julie Andrews put it so well, let's start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. Chapter 16, verse 1, bowl 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first went and poured out his bowl on the earth and severely painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped its image. The second poured out his bowl onto the sea. It turned to blood like that of a dead person and all life in the sea died. 
The third poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. The fourth poured out his bowl on the sun. It was allowed to scorch people with fire, and the people were scorched by the intense heat. The fifth poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. The sixth poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its waters was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. These plagues are similar in nature to what has come before. But the intensity has increased. The seals were one-fourth. The trumpets were one-third. These bowls are complete judgments, and they target those who worship the beast. Just as the song took us back to Egypt, back to the Exodus, so do these plagues. Boils, rivers of blood, the sun darkened, frogs, and in the seventh, hailstones. God is performing mighty acts of power against his enemies. Just like the plagues of Egypt sent to liberate the Israelites from the bondage of Pharaoh, these plagues are meant to move the world to repentance and liberation from the beast's tyranny. Back in chapter 13, we heard that the beast was given authority and permitted to wage war against the saints. And the effect was that they were allowed to slaughter those who didn't bow in worship. Note the difference between the beast and God. God, in his mercy, is giving the world time to repent. As painful as the sores are, they are less severe than the death inflicted on the followers of the Lamb. In the two previous plagues, the seals and the trumpets, there was a negative response from those who worship the beast. In this set of judgments, there is a negative response from those who worship the beast, but there is also a negative response from the beast and its allies. Uh, The sixth bowl highlights this. Then three unclean spirits, like frogs, coming from the dragon's mouth, from the beast's mouth, and from the mouth of the false prophet. They are demonic spirits, performing signs, who travel to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for the battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Rather than surrendering in light of their coming defeat, they intensify their opposition and gather together for battle. The seventh bowl brings the judgments to a close. It's poured out into the air, usually where evil spirits were thought to live. And a loud voice is heard from the temple, from the very throne, saying, It is done. Babylon the Great was remembered in God's presence. He gave her the cup filled with the wine of his fierce wrath. John is about to revisit and unpack what it means uh, for God to remember Babylon the Great in the coming chapters. Uh, So this week, have a read of those chapters. If you thought things were weird already, they get maybe even stranger. It makes for good reading. Seven bowls of wrath poured out on the earth, and with them God's wrath is complete. So what's the response? Within these bowls of wrath, there are two responses. One we have become familiar with, I think. Those afflicted blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues, blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. They did not repent of their works or give glory to God. They are not silently obstinate, but declare their loyalty to the beast, even under affliction. I think when we read this, it's meant to be horrible and heartbreaking. These people are in agony, gnawing their tongues because of their pain. Is this really fair? Is this just? Like I said, there are two responses. 
pain, agony, blasphemy, a refusal to repent. And then there is celebration. Not celebration at the misery of those suffering, but celebration at the goodness and righteousness of God. Nowhere previously in the judgment cycles has a comment been made of God interrupting the judgments, a God who is bringing forth these judgments. In verse 5 of chapter 16, the judgments are paused. Again, to highlight what that God, what God is doing is right. Now, the third bowl. I heard an angel of the waters say, You are just, the Holy One, who is and who was, because you have passed judgment on these things. Because they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets, you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. If one declaration wasn't enough to grab the listener's attention, it's quickly followed by another. This one John hears from the altar. Yes, Lord God the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The repetition reassures the readers of the rightness, the validity and the goodness of God's judgment. The question of How long until you judge those on the earth and avenge our blood that was raised from the souls under the altar in chapter 6 have been answered? With the completion of the seven bowls, God's just judgments will be complete and those who have died following the Lamb will be vindicated. The justness of God is seen in His judgment. His justice and righteousness are so closely connected that for God to be righteous, he must judge. And his judgments confirm his goodness. Are God's judgments capricious and overreaction? The song of Moses and the Lamb, the angel and the altar all testify that God's acts are just and right. If God were not to act, that would be unjust. That would be against his character. Chapters 15 and 16 bring out the theme again that we heard from the letters to the churches of comfort and being confronting. Chapters 15 and 16 are a great comfort to those who are suffering on account of Jesus' name. God is true to himself and will act on behalf of his people. He can't deny himself and so will fulfill his promise to protect and to save, to avenge and judge his enemies. For those at risk of persecution in Smyrna and Philadelphia, Jesus says, keep going, hold on to my words, be faithful. The suffering will be worth it in the end. And there is a glorious future that awaits those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. For those at risk of persecution in North Korea, Syria, Nigeria, Mexico, Russia, Jesus says, keep going, hold on to my words, be faithful. But for those who are at risk of blending in, compromising or assimilating, these words in chapter 15 and 16 come with a very sharp warning. To those who have rejected God's good rule and worship the beast, assuming that God's wrath will either not come or surely it won't be as harsh as it seems, be warned. God is true to himself and will act on behalf of his people. He can't deny himself and so will fulfill his promise to protect and save those who submit to the rule of the Lamb. He will avenge their unjust deaths and judge his enemies most severely and completely. God takes sin 
and rebellion very seriously. And his just wrath will come. Jesus himself interjects in the sixth bowl as the beast with the earthly rulers gather together against God. He warns the readers that his coming will be swift like a thief and at an unknown time. He says, look, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who is alert and remains clothed so that he may not go around naked and people see his shame. Be prepared, he says, lest you be found naked and ashamed. Now, this warning is the same warning that he gives to God's people in Sardis, the rebuke that he gave to them in the letters. So maybe the question shouldn't be, is God just? But rather, like God, do we take sin seriously? Do we take God's wrath seriously? Do we celebrate God's judgment of sin? Does the impending wrath of God on our sinful world spur us on to tell those around us to fear God and give Him glory because the hour of judgment has come? Worship the one who has made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Worship Jesus who loves you and has set you free from your sins, by his blood. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are just, the Holy One who is and who was, because you have passed judgment on these things. Yes, Lord, God the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. Lord, Help us to celebrate your goodness and your righteousness and your judgment of sin. Help us to see sin as you do, as horrible, as corrupting. Help us to bear witness to you faithfully, to keep going in amongst suffering and persecution, knowing that the reward for being faithful to you will be great. Heavenly Father, help us to follow the Lamb wherever he goes, knowing that you have got your glory and our good in mind. Amen.